So uh, the the talk part, the research talk part of today's session is going to be given by Luis Aguilera, who's a, a senior postdoctoral scientist working with Brian Munsky, and he's going to be telling us about integrating mechanistic models and machine learning to interpret and design single mRNA nascent chain tracking experiments. Luis, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Ashok, <clears throat> and thank you for the invitation. So my name is Luis Aguilera. I am a postdoc in working in Dr. Brian Nonsky lab and also in Dr. Tim Stasevich lab. And as Ashok just mentioned, um, we are at Colorado State University. And the, the talk of today is integrating mechanistic models and machine learning to interpret and design single RNA nascent chain uh, tracking experiments. This is going to be my, my overview. So I'm gonna start just giving you an introduction about single molecule gene expression with focus on translation dynamics a little bit of mathematical models to interpret single molecule uh, experiments and some uh, Python libraries that we have been working on to design uh, single molecule gene expression experiments. A little bit of, of motivation. So wild life cell uh, imaging is important to understand gene expression. Um, and I think it's important to make like, the distinction that uh, if you have a, a microscope and, and some cells, you can perform two kind of experiments. The first one is uh, with fixed cells. Um, in this way, uh, you, what you normally do is uh, kill the cells to perform the experiment, and uh, you can measure gene expression, uh, green gene expression at, at a given time point. Uh, and eventually, you can get some temporal measurements uh, by taking multiple snapshots at different time points. Uh, with live cell imaging, that is the focus of this talk, uh, you keep the, the cell uh, alive for the for the experiment. And the advantage of doing that is that you can measure. Um, spe special and temporal variation in gene expression. And then you can track this a single RNA or a single protein in time. And I think that this is going to be very advantage advantageous to calculate some important biophysical parameters. Uh, so more motivation, uh, why mathematical modeling is important to understand gene expression. And I can say that for us, it's very important to test and eliminate competing uh, hypotheses. Uh, we also use modeling to determine biophysical parameters such as initiation rates, elongation rates, ribosomal de densities, among others. And we also use uh, modeling to design more in informative experiments. So this is just the introduction how the technology is working. Uh, so to detect single RNAs, what we are using is the MS2 system. The MS2 system works as follows. So basically what we do is use to encode Secondary structures in in the in the in the in the DNA that eventually express in the uh, in the, at the RNA level. So th those MS2 stem loops are, are just expressing at the, at the RNA level, and then they are detected by the MCP proteins and fluorescent dyes. And in that way, you can uh, visualize the the, the RNAs uh, in the cell. So this was introduced more than 25 years ago by uh, Dr. Edward Bertrand. Um, in a similar idea, in 2016, uh, the group of uh, Tim Stasevich and, and different labs more uh, introduced uh, the, 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 the technology to detect the single uh, proteins or nascent proteins. And this is done or implemented in a similar way. So in the, in the DNA, the, uh, there are uh, encoded secondary structures that are displayed when the protein is being produced. So those epitopes that I am marking here, and this is detected by a fragmented antibody. So eventually it's possible to, to detect the, the protein and the RNA at the, at the same time. And in 2019, we extend the, the technology to detect uh, a secondary protein in, in the system. So with an additional uh, set of uh, tags and, and epitopes and, and fragmented antibodies, uh, we can detect multiple uh, proteins uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the assay. Uh, so this is how uh, translation at single molecule resolution looks like. So this is a live cell, this is a human osteosarcoma. And this uh, video was taken by Dr. Tatsuya Morisaki and is part of his uh, publication in 2016. Um, and basically uh, what we are observing here is uh, the KDM 5 e protein. So this protein is a membrane protein. So in, in red, you can see the RNA of the, uh, that is going to produce this protein. So all those spots there so are single, single RNAs. And the green spot are, are, are the protein being uh, being produced. So how do we perform this, the experimental or combined experimental and computational data? So this is um, basically we follow the scientific methods. We we start uh, with a with a hypothesis. Uh, this hypothesis we have to build the, the gene construct. Then we perform experiments in the in the microscope. 
then we collect the data. So to collect the data from, from the experiments or to extract data from, from the experiments, we do basic image processing, like cell segmentation, spot detection, and tracking. Then we perform a data examination. This is basically create mathematical models that represent the, the experiment and then uh, some integration between the, the experiments and the simulations. And finally, the conclusion is just uh, the selection of the, the, of the hypothesis, hypothesis. So, sorry about that. Okay, so the mathematical models that we are uh, using are total asymmetric simple exclusion uh, process or TACEP uh, models. And this has to be uh, was based on the biological uh, 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 process that we are studying, that is translation. So translation is can be divided in three steps. One of them is initiation, and is where, where the the ribosome uh, binds to the to, to the RNA. Then elongation is when the ribosome starts moving along the, the RNA and producing the nascent uh, the nascent protein. And finally, termination is when the ribosome leaves the RNA and produces the, the nascent protein. Uh, the model or the type of model that we are suggesting is just a set of reactions where the first one is representing the initiation rate. So this initiation rate uh, depends on the on the on the uh, yeah so on, on the initiation rate. But this also considering ribosomal footprint. And this ribosomal footprint is basically what I am showing here. That is the fact that the ribosome is uh, occupying some space. In the, in the in the RNA that is basically nine codons in, in the RNA. So this has to be considered in the model. And the subsequent reactions are only just the elongation rates that depends on the codon usage. So basically the codon composition of every uh, of each particular uh, RNA and also the ribosome, ribosomal footprint and the termination rate is just a, a, a constant uh, uh, parameter in the, or is a constant rate in the, in, in the equations. Um, and then the intensity just calculated uh, considering the, the, the ribosomal position that we can get with this uh, reaction here, but also considering the, the specific position of the probes in the, in the specific experiment that we are designing. So we have implemented all these in a, in a, a Python package, RSNAP sim It's RNA sequence donation protein simulator. And as a user, you only need to pass the gene construct of the gene sequence that the code is doing everything automatically. So it's calculating or it's detecting the, the, the length of the gene, the code composition and the position of the, probe, of the probes. And it's uh, calculating, uh, well, it's creating a, 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 and solving a stochastic model. And it's giving you back the intensities uh, uh, fluctuations of the specific experiment that you are designing. So this is more or less an animation that is just showing how the the, the, the model is uh, what the model is uh, representing. So here we have the representation of the RNA, and uh, here at is the basically the initiation process uh, that is allowing to to enter the RNA uh, ribosomes into into the RNA, and they are just producing the the, the protein. So the more ribosomes that enter into the system, uh, make this uh, intensity here at, at the top uh, to increase, and when the ribosomes leave the RNA, they also uh, the the proteins that they produce also dissociate from the RNA and the, the intensity drops in the fluctuations that I am showing here. So this is an animation that is built with, built with the stochastic model, the real, uh, using real proportions and the optimized parameters that I got uh, by combining the experimental data and the simulations. So uh, to combine uh, or, to, or to integrate the modeling and the experimental data, so we are using uh, statistical comparisons that is basically what Dr. Munsky presented you some, minute, uh, some minutes ago. So it's like a sort of functions that are uh, basically comparing the time series and intensity distributions. And in that way, we can uh, calculate important biophysical parameters like the uh, elongation rate and initiation rate. So for example, in this case, I am just showing the experiment for H2B gene, uh, uh, fluctuations uh, uh, for the experimental data, uh, simulations, and then how the model, well, how can we fit them in the model to the, to the experimental data? Uh, for intensity distribution uh, and the autocovariance uh, function. Um, this gene is only 128 columns, but we can do the same for, for a different gene. For example, this one is beta actin that is a little bit longer, it's 375 five columns. Uh, so we did the same thing. So we calculate parameters like initiation and elongation rates based on in, uh, 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 intensity distributions and autocovariance functions. Um, so we extend this uh, technology, as I mentioned before, in 2019 to consider more complex forms of translation, so or non-canonical forms of translation. One of them is ribosomal frame shifting. 
Uh, friendship team is this phenomenon that occurs normally when ribosomes can produce uh, two different proteins from the same uh, RNA. Uh, this is basically the PhD project from Dr. Kenneth Lyon. Uh, so basically what he did is to create this construct with the, contains like uh, this uh, secondary structure that is an stem loop that is known as the lipid sequence and is causing the, the ribosomes to move, to move in the, in the, uh, the open ring frame that is reading. So for example, in, in this particular construct, if the, if the ribosomes continues in the zero frame, it's going to produce a protein that is flag, uh, what, that is flag analyx, and we can detect that in the green channel. And if uh, the, the ribosomes goes into the minus one frame, so if a, a frame shifting event occurs, uh, the, the, the ribosomes can produce a, a different protein, so that is XSL. Uh, B1. Uh, so this was the first time that French shifting was observed at single molecule resolution, and this is what uh, French shifting uh, looks like. So basically, what we have is three kind of uh, spots. So one of them is uh, basically only where we only can detect the signal in the RNA. Uh, the second spot, uh, the kind of spot, is that when we can detect the, the RNA, but also the proteins in the zero frame. So basically, this protein here. And the last one is when we can detect the three, the, the three signals, so zero and minus one frame and also the RNA. So I must say that uh, a lot of this in the paper, but I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I can say super fast that frame shifting is very rare. We only observe it in 8% of the time, um, but it's very persistent. It can last for, for 40 minutes. So to reproduce the, the experimental data or to explain better the experimental data, what we pr proposed uh, was a constitutive and a bursting model. Uh, the Borstein model was the one that represents better the, the data. So this Borstein model is similar to the previous model that I mentioned before, the Teshat model, with the only difference is that the, the ribosomes can transition to this uh, secondary uh, open reading frame and produce this uh, uh, protein in the, in the minus one frame. So we have some transitions on and off from every state. And with this, we can, uh, we can uh, reproduce uh, some, uh, uh, some of the data with, with, the, with, the model that, with the model that represent intensity in every one of the frames, uh, blue to green intensity ratio, and also for the fraction of, of the spots in, in each of the frames. Additionally, uh, we calculate the, one of the parameters that are describing what happened after the ribosomes find this secondary structure, this uh, frame shifting uh, sequence. And for this, uh, we perform some uh, run of assays. That those run of assays basically are uh, implemented by using this drug that is harintonin, that is basically blocking ribosomal initiation. So this causes the decrease in the, in the intensity in the, in the signal. So we have it for one, uh, for one construct that is uh, where the frame shifting is very close to the start start cone. And we can observe that there is no very, uh, not a big difference between frame shifting and non frame shifting spots. But then, but then we have this other uh, construct with, uh, where the space between the star codon and the frame shifting sequence is a little bit longer. And uh, what we observe in the, in the intensity is some accumulation of, of uh, uh, well, some, some, some uh, delay in the, in the decrease on the, on the, on the, on the intensity. Uh, this is an indirect measurement of some pause in the, in, in the system. Okay, uh, in a similar way in 2020, so we, uh, Amanda, so basically this is uh, her PhD pro uh, project. Uh, she uh, started working with a, a, a non-canonical form but, uh, of in, uh, translation initiation. And for this, what she did uh, was to uh, build this uh, cap iris bicystronic gene construct that uh, basically allows the, the ribosomes to enter in two different places. So. One, uh, the ribosomes, for example, can enter in the in the cap uh, region of the of the RNA. Then they can produce uh, KDM 5 pro protein that we can detect in the green channel in the in the microscope. So this is the canonical way to, to start uh, translation. But there is another uh, an alternative way to, to start translation uh, that is with this iris sequence. So normally viruses have this kind of uh, sequence to to alternate to as an alternative initiation uh, 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 location in the, in the in the RNA. So in this experiment, if, if this happens, so the, the, the ribosomes are going to produce uh, this protein, KIF18B, and we can detect it in the, in the blue channel in the, in the experiments. So again, we did some uh, basic taste modeling here. 
So we uh, you simulate uh, four different uh, RNA states, and according to the RNA states, the ribosome can start uh, the, the, the the canonical uh, initiation with CAP or or with iris. Don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, to talk about uh, the specifics. But we are going to uh, reproduce a, a fraction of the translation spot for every one of the of the different scenarios, intensity distributions, and run of assays with the specific parameters that I am showing here. Um, I'm gonna talk in the rest of the of the time about the current uh, K limitations or technical limitations that we have and how we are addressing that. So I think that the main problem that we have at the moment is that producing experimental data is very expensive and labor intensive. So the current speed is one gene uh, per PhD. So to get one of the experiments that I just uh, showed before, take like five years. Uh, and one of the main bottlenecks that we have is image processing because it's very labor intensive and is subject to user biases. And another limitation that we have is the single molecule fluorescence image. Imagine is limited to maybe three or four colors, allowing the tracking of only three or four, or four RNA proteins at a time. And this has to be, to, to be uh, well, this is caused by a bleed through. Uh, bleed through is basically signal contamination between channels, so so the the, the overlap of the emission spectrum. Um, and with the Tyson models, they are working well. We are able to reproduce the, the data, but they don't capture the, all the the noise from the microscope. So uh, two years ago, I started working in this uh, this uh, project to to try to solve those those problems. Is uh, RSNAPID. It's a library uh, that we have again in, in Python. Is uh, RNA to uh, RNA sequence to nation protein experimental designer, and the idea is to, to transform the tested models into uh, something that is closer to what we observe in the in the microscope. So this is just a simulation of what we can achieve with RNA-PID. And but how does it work? So basically, it's a three-step process. It's a very simple simulation. The first step is to simulate the cell background. For this, we use real images uh, without uh, spots in the in the in the in the image, and then every pixel in the simulated image is generated by randomly sampling from the Gaussian distribution that is built with the parameters of, obtained from the original video. The second step is uh, simulating the point spread function, and this is done again with the TASEP model uh, with parameters obtained from the literature or FITS. And then uh, the, the SSA intensities or the intensities that I get in from the Tyson models are converted to a two dimensional Gaussian kernel with the amplitude is proportional to the SSA intensity. So basically, the intensity here is proportional to uh, how high is the amplitude of this uh, two dimensional Gaussian. And then uh, finally, the spots are positioned uh, randomly inside of the cell. And then uh, we use performance two dimensional random wall process. And in that way, we can simulate a lot of data. For example, here I am just uh, simulating an experiment that uh, where I am increasing uh, intensity, uh, the number of uh, spots or so the density of the spots. So this one has 40, 100, and 200. For uh, this, is for the KDM5B gene, this one uh, basically what I am doing is increasing the spot diffusion uh, coefficient. So you can see here that the spots are moving faster here. And finally, another thing that we normally have to deal a lot in, with the, the images from the microscope is the signal to noise ratio. And in this experiment, I am, again, I am just increasing the signal to noise ratio. So this is, of course, a, a, an image that is going to be harder to, to process with, a, with an image processing pipeline than, than this one. So we can simulate whatever we want. So, so the idea is that with, with this kind of uh, library, we can eventually solve of, of technical limitations. So I, I, I want to say that we uh, producing a lot of the simulated data, uh, a lot of experimental data can be doable. And we just hope that to, we can speed the, 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 uh, speed the, the number of genes that we can pro produce per PhD. Uh, we are also trying to automate all the image processing. Um, and then the, the final thing that we are planning to do is to extend the the, the number of colors that we can detect in an experiment. So I'm gonna talk super fast about uh, how we are trying to make all the image processing automated. Um, so first we need to understand uh, why uh, image processing is super hard to do with the experiments that, that we have. So uh, normally in a non-automated or manual process uh, to, to process the data, so you have an, an image, then you have a large process that only particle tracking or cell segmentation. 
uh, basically what the user normally do is selecting a threshold. Uh, so selecting parameters and based on test, uh, the, the, the user more or less select uh, the, the best parameter that maximizes uh, the, the numbers of, pot, of spots that are detected in the, in, the, in the image. Let's say that if you are doing something like particle tracking and then you start collecting data. But the problem is that as more uh, images uh, you try to process, the more parameters that you are selecting. And uh, again, this is time consuming, it's very labor intensive and it has to human-to-human uh, -human vari variability. So if you ask a different person to do the same thing, it can give you different numbers. So what we are planning to do, or we are hoping to, to get is a full automated process when you can pass thousands of, of, of cells, have some kind of intelligent algorithm that is doing uh, the segmentation, tracking and quantification, and also uh, automatically uh, manage all the data and also documents all the parameters that the algorithm is, uh, is, is using during the whole uh, pipeline. Uh, this is easier said than done, uh, but uh, what, we are, uh, what, what we are currently doing is uh, this approach of so this pipeline is uh, basically is code in, in Shell and, and Python. And what we have is normally the experimentalists are collecting the, the experiments and then we have only one computer to storage the, uh, the data. So I, I didn't mention that, but uh, the, the, the videos that we have can take like easily uh, gigabytes of, uh, in size. So we have a, a one computer that is a network attached storage used to, to storage the data. Then with protocols, we can retrieve this, this data. And then we have a larger computer to, to perform in, uh, all the different image processing uh, uh, that we are trying to, to automate. So we, we can access to the cluster uh, and obtain, obtain this data. Uh, for this uh, segmentation, the spot detection and, and data management, I am using uh, some libraries like CellPose and TrackPy, but also some of the libraries that we uh, are building here at home. And then after performing this, uh, we say automatically save some metadata, PDFs, data frames, and send all these back to the to the to the to the NAS uh, server. And then the, the the experimentalist can interpret all the, the data. So the simulations are very important for us because we have the, uh, the 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 ground truth. So we have the simulated image, uh, and the, then this thing here is a huge code. The last time I checked, it is was like five thousand lines of code. So if something is wrong, uh, you can you can you can find it by using simulated data. So because we are sending the simulated data, and we expect to get the same thing out, and it's more or less what is happening here. So in red, it's what is the simulation simulated data is, and in in green here is uh, what the tracking is doing. So the intensity that we are expecting uh, uh, match each other in this uh, cumulative probability distribution. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we have a quantitative way to, to test if the whole code is, is working well. Uh, finally, in the last uh, two minutes, I'm gonna talk about the current efforts and challenges that we have. So we are trying to improve single molecule microscopy with machine learning. So this is a William Raymond PhD project. And one of the holy grails that, that we have in single molecule uh, experimental design is to classify a spot or a gene based only on these properties. So intensity, amplitude, frequency, autocovariance functions. So basically what we are trying to, to do or what we expect to get is to have an image, so have some kind of machine learning algorithm and then the algorithm can tell us the specific location of the genes in the, in the image. So for example, tell, tell us like uh, you have gene X, Y, and Z. So, so what we are doing is uh, generating a lot of simulated data as I mentioned before. So uh, with, with a simulator, we can simulate for any gene, uh, any image condition uh, for long times. And we know the true labels because we are simulating the, the, the data. Uh, so let's say that we have a gene X. So we are uh, training a deep neuronal network. So just doing uh, an initial one, uh, one D convolution and regularization from the intensity of, this, of the spots. Then we have 200 dense uh, neuron uh, uh, layers here. And then we expect to get the, the, the classification. So in this training step, as we know the labels, so we, we can uh, basically train the, the network to, to learn the parameters. Uh, and in, in the validation step, when, once we, that we have the, the trained neuronal network, we can pass real image or simulated images and then get the, the specific uh, classification of, of every spot in the, in the image. At the moment, we are still at the, at the point where we are using simulated images, but we are working to 
to to to to work with the with the real data. So, and, and this is one of the most promising uh, uh, results that we have is like uh, the proof of concept that this can actually work. So basically, what we did is to try to classify seven different genes in the same cell. So basically, he has uh, seven genes here. So he separated uh, four of them for one of the channels and three of them in the, in the other channels. So you can see here the, the length of the genes. And then um, uh, this is just basically again the simulation and how the, the machine learning, what the machine learning is predicting. Um, so I think in the average accuracy that he is getting is 85% and 90%. Uh, so this has to do with the length of, of the genes. Those are just the confusion matrix of, for, the, for the different genes. So this is a, a nice proof of concept. So we are using, I didn't mention this, but we are using parameters that are similar to what we can uh, collect in the, with, the, with, the, with the experimental data. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna finish just uh, saying the conclusion and future directions. So as I work in Dr. Mayan Monsky Labs so and he has been working a lot in uh, model-based experimental design. But now we are really working more in the in this uh, direction. Uh, so we are uh, trying to automate all the image processing and data management. Uh, so of course we are always studying the the temporal and spatial dynamics of important genes. Um, and then what we are trying to do also is to increase the 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 capabilities of the technology that we have. So basically by increase the color palette of available available for single molecule experiments. So all the codes are uh, uh, open access and, and they can be accessed in, in the GitHub repositories. So you can just Google Monsky Group like that. And then we have uh, multiple uh, implementations in, in, in GitHub and also in Collab for, for easy access. And I want to say that thank you to, to the Service Lab and the Monsky Group. As I mentioned before, all the experiments were done by Amanda Koch, uh, Kenneth Lyon, Eric Ron, and Dr. Tatsuya Morosaki. And all the software is uh, has been done by by me, but also a lot by Doctor well, by PhD student William Raymond, Michael May, Zach Fox, and Joshua Cook. Cook. And I want to say also thank you to the funding agencies. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Luis. So I'll clap on behalf of the audience. Thanks for a really nice talk. Uh, are there any questions, folks? Uh, uh, we still have. Uh, we can still have to take one question. Let me let me let me start it off. Uh, you 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 have this uh, in your initial slide. You talked about the ribosomal footprint. So that's that's something which I don't know the biology of. Is the isn't the ribosomal footprint kind of constant or you know why why would it be a variable in your in your model? Yeah. So it's it's a constant. So it's basically a parameter in the. Okay. Okay. Yes. So they're not different types of ribosomes with different footprints, or it's not something which depends on the RNA. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's just a constant. So okay. I think that okay. the, the number is nine or ten and uh, columns. Uh, so is the space that the ribosome is using. So in the model, it's just a constant. 